Whew, you guys are going to freak out. Snapchat is freaking out. If you have children or you love a child in this world, you need to know about this. The Rolling Stone just dropped a shocking expose on Snapchat. I'm going to show you the craziest parts, and I have an interview tomorrow morning with Paul Solotaroff, the Rolling Stone writer who investigated the drug trade on Snapchat. So stay tuned for that. Title is Snapchat's Teen Opioid Crisis. Law enforcement and grieving families allege that the social media giant Snapchat has fueled a teen overdose epidemic across the country. Notice the Snapchat logo turned into a deadly pill here. So let's get into it. Between 2019 and 2021, teens started dying in huge numbers from fentanyl. The driver of this plague, cops and feds are saying it's fake pills sold on social media. But this article isn't about social media. It's about Snapchat. Federal investigators across the country are pointing at Snapchat as the reason our kids are getting access to fake pills made with fentanyl. COVID drove dealers online because that's where the kids were and Snap was the top spot. Once the online playground for tweens and teens, Snap was now the big tech face of the fake pill plague. Did you know that fake pills are being sold on Snapchat? Because now you do. The dealers moved to Snapchat because it was effectively a safe space for them. All forensics vanished within 24 hours, wiped clean by the delete function of the app. This made all the difference to fake pill pushers whose product was as lethal as it was deceptive. Two milligrams of fentanyl, think 10 grains of salt, would asphyxiate a teenager in his bed. And lots of people ask me why sell a product that kills its customers. And here's the deal as it's explained. Dealers don't try to kill their clients, but with fentanyl, it's the cost of doing business. You can produce a fake oxy for less than five cents a pill and sell that to a kid for $30. They don't care about dead kids because the profits are huge. And again, this is primarily happening on Snapchat. Law enforcement says that drug dealers commonly seal the deal on Snapchat because of its clandestine features. Former DEA agent Bill Bodner says, if you're a fake pill dealer, where would you rather work? On a platform where they destroy all evidence of your crimes or on TikTok where they keep and archive the evidence in case law enforcement calls. And when a kid dies, Snapchat often doesn't help investigators. So drug dealers keep on killing. This article proves that. Bodner says, I spent five years trying to get something out of Snapchat. Not once did they come across with something useful. Court orders and subpoenas sat for weeks and months with Snapchat's law enforcement team. What data Snap disclosed after long delays proved useless insufficient or both and kids kept dying we can't say not my kid we're way past that we're losing kids like mine and yours from the numbers i'm seeing we're losing hundreds of thousands of kids to fake pills many purchased on snapchat where they're spending all their time communicating with their friends this is happening in all kinds of neighborhoods in big cities small towns it could be your kid next every parent who's lost a kid thought not my kid or had no idea that drugs are being sold on Snapchat. I cannot think that anymore. This article makes it clear. So a few years ago, grieving parents realized what was happening. They connected the dots and started pushing on Snapchat back in 2021. Snapchat executives met with these parents at that time and minimized the role of Snap in the fentanyl crisis. They said that Snap was just a small company and is only now learning about this problem. But Snap was worth $50 billion at the time. And there were reports from 2017 of Snapchat being alerted to fake pills being sold on their platform. How did we get here to a place where our children are communicating on an app that has been named an open air drug market? Snap CEO Evan Spiegel is pretty smart and I think it's important to know about the character of the man who created this platform that our kids are using. When Snap CEO Evan Spiegel was 20 and in college at Stanford, his frat brother came to him with an epiphany. He was sending phone pics of himself to a girl he knew and he wished he could make them vanish once she got them. We should make an app that sends deleting picture messages. Evan said that's a million dollar idea. They brought in a third partner and created the app with the press draft citing campus betches and the perils of incriminating photos. Without this app, a betch would be at the mercy of her captor if anyone got a hold of her phone. At this point, the app was called Pickaboo and it had the same ghost logo. And today, Evan walks back the smuttiness of its birth, saying, I just don't know people who sexed on Snap. It doesn't seem fun when you can have real sex. What? That's bullshit. There are millions of people sexting on Snap. Evan would know that more than anyone. It was the entire purpose of the app. Let's take a look at an email that Evan Spiegel wrote to his frat brothers when he was 19 or 20, and I'm sorry for the crude language, but this proves that his baked-in misogyny runs deep. He writes, Hope at least six girls suck your D last night. Fuck bitches get laid. Have some girl put that large Kappa Sigma D down her throat. 
Can't wait to see everyone on the Blackout Express. I wonder if my TA has ever been peed on. She was pretty hot for a tri delt. Evan apologized for these emails, which were leaked in 2014, citing his fraternity days, and they in no way reflect who I am today or my views toward women. Is this email just normal frat guy stuff? Has Evan, who's now 34, changed like he says he has? I'll let you decide, but the fact that kids have been dying on his platform for years, he's known about it, and he has done nothing. I'm going to call bullshit on his evolution. So in the fall of 2011, Evan scanned the metrics on his initial platform and saw that the usage peaked between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. His core customers were school kids, not frat boys sending ghost pics of bongs and boners. So he course corrected. He developed filters that turned kids into kittens and ponies, allowed them to swap faces with their friends. Kids could climb the ladder on Snap, posting content that earned them clout with other teens. Sending lots of snaps boosted a kid's Snap score, which fast became a badge of social capital. And kids started to get addicted. And kids also started to get quick ad recommendations to people they didn't know. Laura Marquez Garrett, a senior attorney at the Social Media Victims Law Center, is quoted, We tested it ourselves, posting as 16-year-olds on three new burner phones. On two of them, we got a quick ad screen with hundreds of friends we didn't know, men with pill or dick emojis in their handles, and women with dollar signs. I think that anyone who has signed up for Snapchat knows that Snapchat recommends people to us that we don't know. Some of these quick ad recommendations started to be drug dealers selling fake pills. And an especially scary part is that once one kid connects to a drug dealer on Snap, It gives that dealer access to all that kid's contacts as well. And at this point, kids are hooked. One college student shared, you literally can't function without it. It's how we talk to each other. You'd be totally nowhere without it. 92% of Snap's user base is between 12 and 17, and Snap earned $4.6 billion last year. But as more kids continued to die, the bereaved parents got louder. Snap continued to do nothing. Dealers plastered menus of their pills and prices on their public-facing stories page. They posted up in places where kids hung out and pinned menus to their Snap Map tabs. Up popped profiles of Snap users nearby. And Snap makes it really easy to tell kids from cops. All you have to do is look at their Snap score. No cop could build a score in the six figures. Snap was by far the top spot for dealers, and once they knew how easy it was, they just never left. And generally, parents have no idea this is happening. And here's why. Most parents are not on Snapchat. Snapchat markets itself as an app for kids. It's light and bright and cartoony and kiddish. But if you downloaded the app as a self-identified grown-up, you'd get a whole lot of nothing in your feed. Some innocuous friend suggestions, pushy requests to link your contacts, and a spinning wheel of crass but harmless fluff. But log in as a teen, and you'd find a vastly different bag. Laura Marquez Garrett shared, based on our interviews with 100-plus kids, Boys were getting menus for serious drugs within weeks of signing up, and if you were a girl, you were getting dick pics from strangers, even if you posted no content of your own. Is that what we want for our kids? It's not a good deal. They can message on some other app. This is too dangerous. So nearly 100 families are now in the process of suing Snapchat for the children's deaths, stating that fentanyl killed these children after Snap connected them to drug dealers. Here's another crazy part. Like I said in 2021, Snap execs meet with parents who have lost children. Snap tells the parents that they're going to hire Tim Mackey, a data scientist who is going to scour Snapchat and remove drug dealers. And they did hire Tim Mackey, but they never let him touch Snapchat. Instead, they hired him to scrape other platforms and report those users back to Snap meaning they would find dealers on Instagram, for example, who are saying, find me on Snap and alerting Snapchat of those dealers. But he was never allowed into Snapchat. So they lied to parents in 2021. Snap had the technology to be able to eradicate this problem, and they chose not to. And how many children have died since then? This Rolling Stone investigator asked Tim Mackey, what would it take to improve kids' safety on social? Mackey didn't pause before he spoke. Quote, the criminal indictment of a tech firm. He's saying that what Snap is doing is criminal. Federal investigators continue to struggle with getting information on the drug dealers from Snap. Quote, in all my years of doing this, we got nothing back from Snap. So we had to get lucky with the victim's phone. Investigators would need to get into the phone within hours before the text disappeared or hope that the child and dealer spoke by some other means, a phone call or a non-snap text. How many boys must die in their beds before a movement rears its head? How many, you guys? One more? A hundred? A thousand more? How about none? There is a dozen things that Snapchat could do today to stop perpetuating this problem, to stop catering to drug dealers over children, to stop killing kids. But they won't because 
because they profit off of our children's interactions with drug dealers. It's as simple as that. I'm infuriated. You should be infuriated. We feel pressure to give our kids access to this platform because they want to chat with their friends, but then Snapchat is connecting them with drug dealers. Children are dying. Children like your children, children like your children's friends. I can't stress that enough. I've talked to enough of their parents. We have to keep our kids off Snapchat. We have to be loud and protect our kids. We have to tell all the parents we know, send this article, send this video, and call your freaking senators. Call your members of Congress. Tell them that Snapchat is complicit in killing children, and this has got to stop. I have much more coming in my interview with Rolling Stone writer Paul Solitaroff tomorrow.